annual fundraiser uh, by honoring local poets every year. So uh, I happen to be, I'm not saying this because I happen to be one of the honorees this year, um, but Rick Lowe, uh, those of you who know who did uh, Project Row Houses, and, um, is also honored this year. And so they have their fundraiser party and uh, you know, maybe Anna will say just a couple of words about that for everybody if there's any invitations or... Um, so as Fadi mentioned, I work for Voices Breaking Boundaries and we have a fundraiser coming up. Fadi is one of five honorees. We're celebrating our 15th year in Houston. It's our quinceanera. Um, so we're honoring Lisa Harris, who's an opera singer, Paul Hester, who's a photographer, Fadi, Rick Lowe and Delilah Montoya. Um, one of our former honorees is here as well, Gwen Zapeda. She was last year's honoree. Um, so if you're interested in attending, you can go to our website at bbarts.org. Tickets are, for one person, 115 For a couple, it's 175 It's 115 in honor of our 15th year. So if you're interested in attending or volunteering and getting free tickets, you can do that as well. And it's the same way, just go to our website. And thank you, Fadi, for bringing that up. I appreciate it. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, I will just, uh, Harvey and I uh, know each other uh, a few from a few years back, and I just want to uh, take the conversation in a, a normal uh, or flowing sense, and maybe we'll get to a point where uh, we can just have questions and, and you can respond to, to them. So I, I just discussed with you before we started this quote that I found, I always found interesting by uh, Hannah Arendt in uh, The Social Question, um, where she mentions that unlike political democracy, uh, where representation uh, through election uh, is necessary, um, science and poetry, in particular she mentions poetry, are exempt from the democratic process. We can understand that about science. So it's just an interesting, it's an interesting uh, point to bring up. We can understand that about science. Right? There is no democratic process about science. You either figure something out or you don't figure it out and everybody jumps on the... But about poetry, she says, the poets, essentially, and I'm paraphrasing, who survive time, if you will, are those who um, are voted in, not by the word of masters, the fiat of masters, the word fiat she uses, but actually by, by those who are readers of poetry, are lovers of poetry, and are incapable of writing a single line. It's a very harsh sentence, mm -hmm. and uh, I wonder if it is also outdated, or to what extent is it outdated, and what does it mean, like somebody told me, well, you know, Hannah Arendt does, doesn't mean that she's always right, but what, what, what do you think about this? Because this is certainly not the way we think about uh, poetry in a public space, Hannah Arendt spent much of her writing uh, about the idea of politics in a public space, polis. Um, and so I was wondering, with all this conversation that we uh, usually centers around this notion of poetry, poetry in relationship to the, to the, to the public space, and I just was wanted sort of you to riff off on that uh, as a starter. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, it's it's a very, very interesting question, and the Arendt quote, which I hadn't known about until you mentioned it, um, it reminds me of uh, Joseph Brodsky in his essay collection called Less Than One, makes a very similar claim that, that neither science nor art is democratic. Um, and I wonder whether things are quite so clear as all of that. Um, so, for instance, um, you know, I have family members who um, think that there should be essentially a democratic decision about things like evolution. Um, and so, the uh, <laughs> claim is that it deserves equal time in the same way that, that whatever other thing we would normally think of as part of the civic domain. And, and so, the sense is that that scientific theories 
have a kind of right to that same version of equality. Um, so it, it seems like it's a little bit of a troublesome um, notion in that way. Um, and, and the Arendt uh, passage also makes me think about all the ways in which poets have tried to get hold of the, the acuity and the um, exactitude and frankly the prestige of science. Um, Zukowski and Pound and, and so many of the modernists very much wanting to claim poetry as a, as a science. Um, so it, it does seem as though it's um, There's a little bit of a gray area in addition to the, the sort of clear division of separation of science and art from other um, sorts of things, but but it certainly um, it draws attention to the degree to which art is reciprocal with the audience. Um, and so, if I'm a lab scientist and I discover whatever, I would discover a new bacterium. It doesn't matter whether anybody likes it or not. It doesn't matter whether anybody cares. It's the, the facts are the facts. The data is the data. Um, but if I write poems that nobody cares about, then nobody cares about them. And, and that's an important, um, that's very important about the poems. Um, it may not be the only deciding factor. There are plenty of people who wrote plenty of poems that nobody cared about at the time that we now care about Later. a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but, but there's a, a very interesting kind of reciprocity that's, that is truly reciprocity between poet, poem, audience. Um, really is a, a, an engagement um, that, that really doesn't happen without all of those parties present in some way. But, but Aaron doesn't specify, as you said, specify a time for those readers, lovers of poetry who can't, who are incapable of writing a line, to come 100 years later and pick up an Emily Dickinson, for instance, or so forth. Um, so in that sense, we can agree with her. But at the same time, uh, she deliberately, if, if you go back to that essay, um, I think it's the, the essay on revolution, uh, uh, she deliberately wants to take the arts out of the power dialectic conversation right. um, by saying that we have enough evidence in time that what we need is a much better plural democratic conversation in politics, but in arts, um, the uh, dictatorial right. or the totalitarian, in a sense, since she's, she, that was her sort of main bent. Is, is okay because that's the way it works. Um, I don't know what Hanar would think about Twitter and Facebook or the idea of the, uh, the, the, the political, the public space being so infiltrated, if you will, uh, to appease the GOP and many others, uh, and also Democrats, um, uh, with, with um, non, um, non-essentials, if you will, right? All these immigrants, uh, brownies, blacks, uh, uh, what have you. The idea that there is this notion of globalization uh, and the resistance to it. And, and so what, what happens to poetry in an age like this? Um, because I guess what I want to, to ask you is, well, some of your poems, some of your books are, one can imagine them much more accessible and have a reciprocal audience than others and how do you how do you you know have how do you think about that and we'll talk about a couple of those in particular that I have in mind yeah. that actually Anise mentioned yeah yeah I mean I, I would want to contrast my ambition in terms of engagement with the audience to um, this will be this is an anecdote involving um, the poet Ted Kuzer a former um, U.S. Poet Laureate, um, and this is not intended, I'm taking a position different than his, it's not intended as a slight against him. Um, but during a visit to our um, university a few years ago, one of the things that he mentioned was that he has a kind of a test for his 
Holmes, he was a business executive. Um, I think he's retired now, but was a kind of high up business executive in an insurance company. And he said that his test for a poem was that he would read it to his secretary, and if she understood it, then it was okay, and if not, not. Um, and so I want to I want to distance myself from that version of engagement with the audience, uh, which seems to me to make some troubling assumptions about. Um, gender, mm. employment, formal education, uh, just a lot of things about mm -hmm. who, who's entitled to understanding, whose understanding is at a high level and whose is not. Um, so I want to distance myself from that and substitute an idea that is much more like um, offering an alternative criterion. It seems to me that our contemporary American, in my, in my limited experience elsewhere, global culture, is um, suffocating under a kind of um, um, a singularity of, of criterion of judgment that it, if X increases capital, X is good, and if not, not. And we see it showing up in all our spheres of life in, I'm employed in a higher education institution, and everything is about job training, preparing students for the workplace. Are they gonna make more money after they get out of school than before they got in school? And why should you go to college? Well, because it's a small investment now, but you'll make more money than your high school friends who didn't. So everything is put into terms of money. And what I want to propose is that poetry is one of the means through which, as our art installations, poetry is one of the means through which we can propose alternative criteria for value judgments, through which we can identify other grounds for making decisions about our lives. And, and that, that seems to me to be a, a very live form of engagement with, um, you know, among, among all of us that doesn't depend exactly on contemporaneity and doesn't depend on my knowing an audience member face to face. Immediacy. That, that can, there can still be an engagement um, a live engagement um, and, a, and a profound engagement. It seems to me to be a, I mean, it's about how we live our lives. It's about who we are um, and, and who we are to one another. Um, and so it seems to me that poetry is one of the places in which we can think of ourselves differently. I, I want to go further and maybe be a pro, you know, provocative. There is a, uh, there's a, an, an essay titled The Regression of Poetry by a, uh, a German romanticist uh, named uh, uh, Jochman or Wachman or uh, J-O-U-C-H-A-C-H-M-A-N, I don't know how, but Walter Benjamin unearthed the essay and actually had a longer introduction of the essay than the essay itself. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's worth a read. It's a fabulous, uh, fabulous two pieces. And and uh, uh, Jochman says uh, in it essentially that the reason for uh, uh, the regression of poetry is is it's a good it's a good thing because it means that there is true human progress. So the idea, so sort of a Vichian notion, Vico's notion of. The anthropology of poetry as an orality for memory and documentation and communication is no longer necessary. That much of what happens in poetry today, for example, is actually documented through other means. And that goes straight through Walter Benjamin's uh, uh, the, uh, uh, art in the age of uh, mechanical reproducibility and so forth. We have cinema, we have the visual arts and, and with such intensity that actually we have uh, such uh, you know, human progress to the point where that's the reason, that's the primary reason for the